Good morning. We'll be in James chapter 5 as we begin. James chapter 5. We'll be reading from verse 7 and 8 this morning to start us off as we prepare our minds and our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper. In the first uh, six verses of James 5, he really harshly condemns the rich, wicked, non-Christians of the world who have been living lives of extravagance in hoarding up treasures, taking advantage of the poor, and even persecuting these poor, impoverished Christians that James is writing to. And after he condemns the wicked rich, he then turns to these poor and righteous Christians and gives them these instructions in James 5, 7 and 8. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. James encourages these impoverished, suffering Christians to wait on the Lord and His timing, to be patient and to trust in His faithfulness, even throughout their persecution. And as I considered this passage, it dawned on me that Jesus understands exactly what it's like to be a poor man who is persecuted by the rich and powerful. Jesus was born into a poor family. And even during his ministry, he only lived off the meager financial contributions of his followers. And he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In contrast, the Pharisees, it says in Luke 16, 14, were lovers of money and were scoffing at Jesus. Jesus talked a lot about money, and that's why they hated him so much, too, because they understood so much of his talk about money and the love of riches was aimed right at them. He said in Matthew 23, and I'm reading all these just for the sake of time, um, you don't have to worry about necessarily turning to them, but Matthew 23, 6 and 7, they love the place of honor at the banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings by men in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. See, the Pharisees, they were lovers of money and they were lovers of power. And sadly, it's a common theme all throughout Scripture that the rich and the powerful take advantage of and oppress the poor and impoverished, and they live without any thought of God at all, even to the point of killing the poor if they are in their way of getting rich and getting what they want. In fact, look in verse 6 of James 5. He says this about the wicked rich there, that you have condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. One of the greatest examples of this is when Ahab in the Old Testament, the rich king of Israel, he wanted Naboth's vineyard. But you know, Naboth, that was really all he had. That was his family's inheritance. He, he couldn't sell that. He couldn't get rid of that. And so Ahab goes in and he pouts and his wife Jezebel comes in and finds out about the situation. And Jezebel has Naboth murdered so that they can take his vineyard. It's a despicable story. And the Old Testament prophets cried out all the time about the riches oppression of the poor. For instance, Isaiah 3, 14 and 15, the Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor? Declares the Lord of hosts. Amos 8, 4, hear this, you who trample the needy to do away with the humble of the land. This was such a common experience that the, the wicked rich became kind of a stereotype in the Psalms. So for instance, Psalm 10, 6 and 8, the rich says to himself, I will not be moved throughout all generations. I will not be in adversity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. In Jesus' life, that stereotype proved true. Because he was a completely innocent, righteous, poor man who was hunted 
by the rich and the powerful Pharisees sitting and waiting in the lurking places, stealthily watching Jesus to try to trap him, to find some excuse to kill him. And it's just so ironic, Jesus really had no possessions, and yet they were still jealous of him. And they wanted to take the only things that Jesus had, which were his life, his dignity, and his following that was stealing their thunder. Yet Jesus, through all of it, was patient, and he waited on the Lord. True biblical patience when we're suffering isn't just the temporal waiting, like, This is going to be a while waiting in line at the DMV. It's a very special kind of waiting that's rooted in faith, in trust in the Lord. And it's based on three major pillars. Number one, faith to keep doing the right thing no matter what. Number two, comfort in knowing that God will reward you. And thirdly, hope of vindication in knowing that your enemies will not get away with it in the end. And what I'd like us to do for the rest of the lesson is to read Psalm 37 together. That's why I read all those verses and didn't have you turn there for time's sake, because we're going to do a lot of reading this morning. We're going to read all of Psalm 37 together, because here we have a psalm by King David. And David was a foreshadowing of Jesus. And David suffered mightily at the hands of the rich and the powerful. And he writes this psalm to teach us how to be patient in suffering like he was. And in Psalm 37, we will see those three pillars of patience over and over and over again. Keep doing the right thing no matter what. The Lord will reward you. The Lord will vindicate you against your enemies in the end. And as we go along, we'll pause and relate this to the life of Jesus. Look in verses 1 through 6 to start. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. So we find all three pillars in these verses, but I want to emphasize verse 1 here, because one of the things that kept Jesus so balanced and so patient in suffering is that He never allowed Himself to be jealous of the Pharisees and their rich powerful positions. I'm sure there were a lot of people in that day who envied the Pharisees, who wanted their money, who wanted their knowledge, who wanted their fame and their popularity, but Jesus didn't care about any of that. In fact, he passed that test even before his ministry started when Satan told him, look, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all the power and glory that you could ever want, Jesus. Just bow the knee to me. And Jesus said, go, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So when Jesus encountered the rich and powerful Pharisees, he was ready. And he didn't spend any time being jealous of them or wanting what they had or trying to make moral compromises to be more like them. No, he knew they had all those riches and popularity and and, and all that social clout, but they didn't have God. And so Jesus was able to suffer patiently without envying his oppressors. Verses 7 through 11. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while in the wicked man... He'll be no more, and you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. So we find all three pillars of patience here too. Do the right thing no matter what. God will reward you. God will vindicate you against your enemies. And what I want to focus on is verse 8 here. Because it's certainly true, Jesus did get angry at the Pharisees, but it wasn't a selfish kind of anger that was mad at them for persecuting him. No, he was mad at them for the way they treated God and the way they treated other people. Like when they made God's temple into a place of business and Jesus made this um, whip 
out of cords and he drives them out. You, you never see Jesus flipping tables over because he's just so frustrated that the Pharisees keep bothering him, you know, <laughs> keep persecuting him. That's not why Jesus flipped tables over. He had a righteous indignation that they were disrespecting God and they were dishonoring other people made in God's image. But he wasn't filled with a bitter anger or a resentment for the way they were treating him. You know, if he were to allow that kind of anger to creep in, then just like verse 8 says, it would only lead to evil doing. He would end up stooping to their level. He would end up trying to find ways to get even with them, trying to make their lives miserable for making his life miserable. But Jesus, just like in verse 11 here, rose above all that by humbling himself, not trying to defend his own honor in prideful anger. That is what allowed him to suffer patiently. Verse 12 to 22, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. But the Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. Their sword will enter their own heart, and their bows will be broken. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked would be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil, and in the days of famine they will have abundance, but the wicked will perish. And the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke they vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those blessed by him by, uh, will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. Again, all three pillars of patience are here. But I want to focus on verse 13, because it helped Jesus stay patient to know what was coming for the wicked. He knew. He saw their day coming. He was the chief cornerstone in God's temple. And he said in Matthew 21, 44, He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. In Matthew 23, 33, he says, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Jesus did not allow the wicked oppressors to move him off of his righteous path and to be wicked like they were because he knew exactly where they were headed for all eternity. He knew their wicked schemes against them would only be reversed by God so that the swords and the bows that they used to attack Jesus would be turned on themselves and God would laugh at their wicked plots in the end. It allowed Jesus also to be content with the little that he had on this earth because he knew from an eternal perspective, that verse 16 is so right that it is so much better for him to be righteous and to have a little on this earth than to be wicked and to have a lot. That helped him suffer patiently. Verse 23 to 26, the steps of a man are established by the Lord and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Now this section emphasizes one pillar in particular, and that is God's reward for the faithful. Jesus understood, verse 24, that even if it seems like he's falling, and there's no way he's ever going to recover from this fall, God will be there to lift him up and to support him. Even though on the cross he will feel forsaken and he will cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He will know in his mind, verse 25, that God has never forsaken the righteous or abandoned them in their desolate state. God always comes through. That helped Jesus suffer patiently. Verse 27 to 34 Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. But the Lord will not leave him in his hand. Or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Again, all three pillars of patience here. 
Jesus did the right thing no matter what. Just like in verse 30 and 31, he always used his words to speak wisdom, to speak justice, and to put God's law in his heart. Because he knew in verse 33 and 34 that God wouldn't allow him to be condemned under the judgment of his rich oppressors. Those those rich, powerful oppressors were condemning Jesus on the cross as a criminal. They were charging him with the worst crime against God, blasphemy against the Lord. But Jesus knew God wouldn't let that conviction stand. That if he would just continue to do the right thing no matter what, God would vindicate him of all of those charges and exalt him in the end. And that helps Jesus suffer patiently. Final section. David kind of brings it all together and sums it up here. 35 to 40. I have seen a wicked, violent man spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright, for the man of peace will have a posterity. But transgressors will altogether be destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. All three pillars are here too. As David brings all this together, Jesus understood verses 37 and 38 that there was a future for him and that the wicked would have no future. And Jesus understood that Even if he were to die, God would raise him to life again, not only in this glorious resurrection, but then he would allow him to create a new covenant people who would then follow his example of faithful, righteous suffering through trials just like he did. A people who would also take refuge in the Lord and be rewarded for it too. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, a couple things I want us to think about. First of all, let's be so thankful that Jesus stayed patient in suffering. Because if Jesus would have lost his patience, it would have led him to evil doing, which means his sacrifice would be worthless and we would all be lost. Our salvation is dependent 100% on the patience and the ability of our Savior to wait on the Lord. And this morning, we may be suffering in some way, either from persecution by people in our lives, or maybe just from Satan and his attacks on our life or our health in some way. And it may be tempting to just give up. It may be tempting to envy the popular or the rich who never seem to have any problems and tempting to make moral compromises to be more like them. But the fact that Jesus suffered patiently should encourage us to know that we can suffer patiently too. And the fact that his life proved those three pillars of patience to be 100% true means that they'll be true in our lives as well. And that means we can have the faith to keep doing the right thing no matter what. We can have the comfort in knowing that we have a reward waiting for us in heaven. And we can have the hope of God's vindication for us against our enemies, physical and spiritual alike. Let's remember these things as we partake.